So we are back on uh, for our final session on uh, tax planning and structuring the deal with Mike. Uh, Mike, um, we've been working with uh, James Moore for quite some time now, and I've had the opportunity to uh, be, wor be working closely with Mike for probably about three years now, I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, and I continue to be impressed with the um, level of expertise and um, knowledge and compassion you bring uh, to the clients that we work with. So I'm really excited to see what you have to share today. I'm going to go ahead and uh, get into your bio now, if I can see where I put it. Mike Zibley has over 20 years of experience as a certified public accountant and is the partner in charge of the firm's Daytona Beach office. He has served organizations re uh, representing various industries, including manufacturing, construction, and other commercial and professional enterprises, as well as governmental entities. He has a fabulous um, podcast on manufacturing. I encourage you to check it out if that's your area. Mike serves as an integral member of the firm's auditing and accounting team with an emphasis on audit and tax services. He also leads the firm's transition planning services team and the implementation of Lean Six Sigma practices within the firm to increase efficiency with our auditing process. So I'm gonna hand it over to Mike, take it away. Let's learn about tax planning and structuring the deal. Okay, thanks Heather. Well, and first I think before I jump into tax planning and structuring and, and things of that nature, I think one of the things that's important is perhaps to back up a little bit and say, okay, what we've heard today is great stuff from Mike Kerrigan. And then again, from Scott Bushke is about this starting with, okay, where are we at right now? Okay, what do we look like as a business organization? And this discovery process of saying, okay, what's my business value now? And some of the other factors of the business, it's really important to say, okay, where are we right now? And then with that, we start our financial planning process. And then part of that is the tax planning and what this might look like to say, okay, at the end of the day, how much is my business worth? What could I theoretically take out of the business if I did sell it? And if, if we're not where we need to be, what are the steps that we need to take in order to get there? So really the things that we talked about today are part of the beginning discovery process of just getting a sense of what we look like today, what things would look like if we were to sell the business. So that way we can start that planning process. The discovery components that Heather and Velocity do, that we do, that Scott does, and then Alta, and, and you know Mike and his team is really, really cr critical because it's gonna shape the path. Now, there's many, many instances where I'll have a company call me and say, hey, we need help, we're selling our business, my accountant doesn't know what we're doing, it hasn't really handled this kind of stuff, so we really need somebody with a little more experience. It's not even uncommon where they haven't even talked to an attorney yet, and you know, so we get involved and you know, some of the things that Scott mentioned, well, their financial statements are not in good order. Uh, they're, they're, you know, I just actually have when we went through and they didn't even have support. They, they didn't really know what their inventory balances are and an inventory made up the majority of their financial statements. When you looked at their net income, the net income was so low compared to what the, the business held for assets and inventory that, you know, it's almost like if they were to sell right now, they could probably get a price for their inventory and perhaps a little tiny bit but for goodwill, but that's not at all what they would have expected. We actually, by the time we got through and really did some analysis, said, you know what, let's hold off on selling the business right now. We've got to take another look at this and figure out, let's, let's get some things in order and so you can maximize that value. And I've, I've had that happen a number of times. And so that's why this planning part is so, so important. Um, I'll jump into the, this, but I do want to caveat this by saying that when we get into structuring the deal, I think Scott hit it right on the head. We've got to have this conversation with an attorney as part of the process, because I'm going to hit on some of the basic concepts today. And in 45 or 50 minutes of time, you, this stuff is so complicated. We could spend all day just on one component of this. And, you know, so, and, and there's just so many different structures that could fall in place, mixes of things. So um, I, what I want to do, though, is give you some sense of an overview of what to expect. Uh, again, a lot of people, I, you know, a lot of businesses, they sell, and all of a sudden, by the time they get done paying off the debt in the business and paying the taxes, they're not, they're not, they're shocked at what they're going to be left over with. And so that's why planning in advance is really, really, really critical to this process. And at the end of the presentation, I will show um, 
uh, you know, kind of a flow of funds, so to speak, what it might look like in a theoretical situation. Very, very simplistic. So we're going to review entity types. Uh, we're going to talk about transaction options, payment options, tax planning based on the sale type. And I'm going to hit on some negotiating points, just a few negotiating points that are some of the basic ones. Uh, there are certainly other ones when you get into the complexity of a deal, depending on your structure. But I want to hit on some of the some of the basic ones. And the reason why I got to start with the type of entities that are out there is there, there's there's a lot of there's several different types. And depending on what you are as an entity is going to shape the conversation. So let's start with a C Corp. So C Corporation's been around for a long time. Uh, those are corporations, C corporations are almost like their own and their own individual. The C Corp pays the taxes themselves. Okay, everything happens within that. You can kind of think of C Corps like your, your big companies, your Pepsis and you know, your Amazons and all those guys, those are C Corps. And there's a lot of small businesses that still exist as C corporations. Many, many, many of them transitioned into S corps years and years and years ago, but there's still some out there. In fact, I just had a client that we worked with uh, a year ago that was uh, still a C corp. Now, C corporations, like I said, they pay taxes, and you may have, um, you may recall when the tax jobs and uh, tax cuts and jobs act came out in 2017, uh, when the Trump administration passed that law. Uh, with, with Congress, obviously, uh, they actually reduced the corporate tax rate to a flat 21% for federal purposes, okay? So in some cases, we had people saying, hey, should my S Corp flip back into a C Corp? There were certain circumstances where that may have made sense, um, but in a lot of cases, it didn't make sense. And part of the reason it didn't make sense is because the, the entity pays tax at 21%, not plus there's state income taxes depending uh, on the state. So in Florida, it might be uh, you know five percent, for example. Um, but then when you pay a dividend out of that C corp, you're now paying dividend at, at potentially as high as twenty three point eight percent. Capital gains rates go up to twenty percent, and then there's the uh, net investment income tax, which is part of the uh, the ACA law that changed under the Obama administration a long, long time ago now. Uh, so at 3.8%, so you have 23.8%. So let's think about this. We've paid tax at 21% federally. We might pay a net tax to the state. I say net because state taxes are deductible of say 4.5%. So we're at somewhere around 25. And if we take that dividend out of the, out of the company, now we're going to add another 23%. So we're at almost 50% taxes. Yeah. Okay. So let's think about this if we sold our assets in the corporation. We own a C Corp and we sell all the assets. We're still going to own that. We're still going to have the C Corp entity itself because we sold the assets. The cash is going to come into that C Corp. We're going to pay tax on the gain of those assets at 21% plus the state income taxes. And then we're going to have to do some of that cash that's sitting in there. Most of the time you want to liquidate. You take that dividend out. Now you're going to pay another 23.8% possibly. Okay, so now you're looking at the better part of 50% taxes on that. So that's, um, you know, that's something we've got to think about and plan for when we go through this process. Now, that's, a, that's how you deal with the sale of, of assets. Now, in many, in other situations, you might see a stock sale. And I'm going to go through what an asset sale is and a stock sale in much more detail. I'm just trying to give you a sense for what this looks like. Now, stock sales, so if you sold your stock, you no longer own the entity anymore. The entity then goes to whoever the buyer is, and those are generally taxed at capital gains rates. Again, that'll, that goes up as high as 20% plus the 3.8%. So that's a lot more favorable uh, situation. We're going to talk about the pros and cons on stock sales. I don't see them as much as I would like to see them uh, from a tax standpoint, but we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the next two are uh, S-Corp, and LLC, and I could say LLC slash partnership. Uh, I, I, you, you could look at them basically as kind of a similar piece, but an S corp is uh, very much similar to a C corp. You're, you hold stock in the company, but the difference is S corps are considered pass-through entities. And what we mean by that, if, you, if you're an S corp owner, you're, you're familiar with this, but you get a K-1 
And the tax return that's filed on the ta on an S corp is generally more like an informational return that then allocates the income to your K one. That K one, that income from the business gets reported on your personal tax return. So the classification of a capital versus uh, sale of an asset or ordinary income is what we'll say gets placed on your 1040 and you're taxed at your marginal tax rates. So for a, so in an S corp. The sale of, if you sell the assets of the business, let's, when I say selling your assets, I'm talking about you sold your receivables, your inventory, your property and equipment, less your accounts payable generally, okay? And when you sell that, you still own this corporation still. It's still I got a shell in it of something. Um, and so the sale of those assets, that income is going to be a mix of ordinary and capital gain. And it's going to depend, and we're going to talk about what that means, why, why it's a mix in a little while, but it's a mix. And that then flows down to you, and you're going to pay it at your marginal rate, which right now, right now at this moment, is 37% as a top rate. Now, I also, I've got a slide later on that's going to talk about some of the potential tax law changes and what that impact is on marginal rates and business rates and things of that nature. Okay, but that's going to flow down to you at that 37%. But here's kind of the cool news, okay? When you take that money and distribute it out to yourself, you're not paying tax. You're not paying an additional dividend capital gain rate on that. So your tax rate is generally lower. And so while the top rate might be 37%, you're really paying on a scale over a course. So you might net out to say 30 or 32% on the sale. So it just kind of depends. And then in an S-Corp, if, if you sell your stock, it's generally going to be taxed at capital gains, just like a C-Corp. Mm -hmm. uh, an LLC is interesting because um, an LLC can choose to be taxed as a partnership, as an S-Corp, as a C-Corp, so it can fall in a lot of different ways. Generally, if it's treated as a partnership for this purpose, uh, it's going to be a mix of ordinary and capital, but there's some very unique aspects to LLCs and, and partnerships because you could have these basis adjustments. You could have what's called hot asset issues, and so there's a, there's, a, there's a number of things that we have to work through in a partnership when you're going through the tax planning on this. So it's really important to understand the type of entity that you are is going to have a big impact on how we're looking at it from a tax planning standpoint. So here's the basic types of purchases and sales. Now there's a million, there's probably a, so many other iterations of, you know, I, I think Scott might've mentioned where you might still own some of the company or you might roll your equity into the new company. I'm not gonna really hit on any of that kind of stuff, but just kind of hit the basic ones because these are the ones that you see more than anything else with the, with the primary one being an asset sale to a third party. Uh, we've got stock sales to a third party. We've got ESOPs, which we'll talk about, and then sale to management or family. And I could probably even add on to that and say sale to your business partner. You might be 50-50 with a business partner. You're looking to retire, and that partner is looking to continue in the business. So you may have that as well. But let's look at an asset sale to a third party. Um, first, let's kind of define what this asset sale is. So think about a structure of a business. Uh, you've got a balance sheet. You own what's on this balance sheet. The balance sheet has your assets, which is your cash and your receivables, your fixed assets. It's your uh, liabilities, your payables, your debt, if you have debt. And then, of course, your equity. Okay, So you own this business, this structure. When a third party comes in and they buy your assets, and I think you heard Scott refer to this, and if you heard us back in the first sec session, you heard we're going to do a cash-free, debt-free sale. What that means is you keep the cash, but out of the proceeds of the sale, you've got to pay off the long-term debt. That usually includes your, your lines of credit. That includes your term debt. That includes your lease. If you're, if you're leasing something uh, in a capital lease, any finance equipment, all that is going to be paid off as part of the proceeds. Okay, But what they're buying is they're buying your receivables. They're buying your inventory. They're buying your fixed assets. And when I say fixed assets, just for clarity purposes, that can be your machinery, 
That could be even a building in some cases. That could be, um, that's your office equipment. All of those items are gonna go with the business. Because, and, and on top of that, those are the tangible items, but then they're getting the intangibles that aren't even on your balance sheet. They're getting your customer list. They're getting, you know, perhaps if you have patents out there, uh, which may be on your balance sheet, if you had trademarks, if you have other things that are out there, uh, they're, they're acquiring those as well. But they're also acquiring your, your own intellectual property, your website, your name. All of those things are generally what they're acquiring. And then they're also, if they're going to take your receivables, they're usually going to acquire your payables and any accrued liabilities that you have out there that have not yet been paid in the normal operating. So normal operating liabilities. And so they're going to take, that's, that's what they're really looking to purchase. Now, that's great in some cases. So, you know, when we say it, talk about the advantages, it may be that you're going to sell all those things, but you're going to keep the building. Now, I, I use the building. In some cases, the building is in the, in the business. Oftentimes, you have a building that's separate in a separate entity, and you're paying rent back and forth. And one of the things that, you know, often happens is they don't want the building. They don't want to acquire the buildings, but they're willing to lease it back to you. So that's something that we have to look at in the planning process. But there's a possibility that you could retain certain assets and it could be in your receivables. There might be certain receivables for whatever reason they don't want to take, um, you know, things of that nature. It also allows you to remain in legal control of the business. So if they buy your assets, you still got this entity. And I've seen business owners that say, yeah, I want to get rid of this division or this section, but I want to keep this. So they, so they divide it out and say, here's the things we want to sell. Here's the things that we don't want to sell. So th those are good. That, that's, a, that's a good possibility. Now, the disadvantages to an asset sale is, as I mentioned earlier, it's a mix of ordinary and capital gains if you are a pass-through entity. Kind of the neat thing about, I guess, if you're a C corporation, you're going to pay that rate no matter what it is. It's, it, they don't have capital gains and uh, rates for capital gains and rates for um, ordinary income. It's all taxed at the same amount. Unfortunately, then you've got to deal with the dividend side of things. But you know, from your standpoint, because you've got that mix of ordinary and capital, it is going to be generally a higher tax bracket that you're in. Uh, they, buyers want an asset sale for a couple of reasons. One, because if they buy your stock, they take every liability that ever existed with the business with it. Uh, but if they buy your assets, a lot of times they can, they get immediate deductions. So probably a lot of you as business owners are familiar with bonus depreciation and 179 and how do you buy a, a big vehicle and expense it right away for tax purposes? Well, that's what they want to do. Um, so th that's, that's something that, that becomes part of the negotiating points that we'll talk about a little bit later. So those are some advantages and disadvantages, but generally speaking, most of the deals I see come in as asset deals because it's better for the buyer to get that deduction right away. And one of the things that we're going to talk about is, okay, we've got to allocate this purchase price. Well, they're going to want to put as much to your fixed assets, your machinery and equipment as possible because they can deduct it really fast. That's not good for you. You want to put as much of it to personal goodwill because that does get taxed at capital gains. So these are all the thought processes that we go through and we need to be thinking about. It's very difficult when you say, hey, we've got an LOI. Here we are. We're ready to sell. And oh, by the way, what's the tax going to be on? There's not as much time to start planning for this stuff. So jumping into a stock sale, stock sales, you know, almost probably the simplest way to go in some ways, okay? Because in a stock sale, you're literally taking the stock certificates that you own and you're selling them uh, to this third party. And the great thing is it's tax at capital gains rates and you don't deal with, um, you know, the extra dividends and all that other stuff in the C-Corp. And there's just a lot of, lot of uh, issues that go away. Now, also the liabilities go with them. Now, one of the things they're going to do that you have to be prepared for is during the due diligence, they're going to want you to attest to, hey, are there any lawsuits out there? Is there anything pending? Do you have any liabilities that you're aware of? You're really, and then they may even put some money into escrow that might sit in escrow for 12, 18 months or so as a protection for them if anything pops up. So there's some things that they, that they do have to worry about from that standpoint. One of the other advantages though, if you're a business that has a lot of licenses, contracts, vendor agreements, customer 
is you don't have to reassign all of those. So when you have an asset deal and you're maintaining legal control of the company, you have a lot of, you, if you have a lot of contracts and then you may have to reassign those over to the, the buyer. And one of the problems with that is, you know, now you've got to go to all those vendors or customers and let them know everything, you know, that this situation is happening, which can be a little bit, you know, difficult, could be a lot of work to do. Um, so there, there's a lot that goes down that, down that road, but it's, it makes, it's, it's kind of a simpler transaction and really kind of alleviates you and it, it helps from a tax standpoint. Uh, Is there really a way like, to make that more advantageous for the buyers so that they would be more willing to do that? Yeah, so that's a good question. So yes, when we're dealing with an asset and a stock deal and we're trying to negotiate, you could potentially say, you know what, we're willing to take a little bit of a lower tax or a little bit lower purchase price to get a stock deal because of the tax savings, almost like you're sharing in the tax savings a little bit to, mm -hmm. help, it, to help motivate them to go down this road. On the other hand, if there's an asset deal, you might negotiate up a little bit higher because they're getting a tax savings right away that's costing you. So those are some negotiating pieces that we have to go through um, you know, as, as we look at these different types. And certainly if you have these, if you have significant contracts, uh, other intellectual property that needs to be assigned over to them, uh, that may be something that you really gotta talk about right up front with them. And again, these things are also where an attorney comes in and is really helpful in walking through all of this process. Sale to an ESOP. I actually had a client a few years ago do this. It, it was a. It, it can be a great way to uh, build a, a retirement for your employees. It can be a great way for them to share in the profits. Um, and you can actually do it where you sell 20% now, maybe another 20% later, and you can kind of go gradually step your way into it. Um, or you could do 100%. I've seen, I've seen actually both. One of the cool things about an ESOP uh, is that uh, let's just say you're an S Corp and the ESOP owns 100% of you. Well, there's the, the ESOP, because it is a tax exempt entity, it doesn't pay taxes. So the income from the S Corp does not pay taxes. Uh, there's no tax paid on it. So that helps a little bit of a return on investment there. Um, the downside with an ESOP that I that I've you know, kind of seen is there is a process to set them up. It can be very expensive to set it up. You do have to have fiduciary processes in place, a board, you've got outside valuations that have to happen. There's a lot of, lot of uh, work that goes into these ESOPs. Um, you also have risks if the business doesn't continue up and starts going down. You've got employees. I've seen a lot of lawsuits around ESOPs. So there's some things you really got to make sure you're careful on, but they can be a really good way. Also, it's a good way because, you know, oftentimes the owners continue to stay involved. Uh, you've got a, a lot of times these, these ESOPs are purchased through a leveraged process. So in other words, there's a loan that comes out and they pay the owner. The owner can still stay involved. The owner can be on the board. Uh, so you can make sure that those that the business continues to operate think, in a way that makes sense. Uh, you, you've, you've got some level of protection to, if you need to really step back in. So there, there's some really good things along those ways that allow, I think an ESOP is certainly something to consider um, if you're not really sure uh, how you wanna go and depend on your employee base and things of that nature. Is, it, um, is there a specific size company that ESOPs tend to be better for? Uh, I've seen them in different sizes, but you know I've never really seen them in under... Uh, I'll say, I haven't personally seen them. I think we could get an ESOP expert that probably say, but under $10 million company, I haven't really seen an ESOP go into, but it doesn't mean they don't exist. It's just not something I've, yeah. I've come across. So, um, but you also, you know, you talk about management. And I think as an owner, if you're going to go into an ESOP, I think your management is really, really critical because you're, you're, you're still trying to turn something over and make your way out of the business. But you know the business has to be protected because now you've got this fiduciary responsibility for say 100 employees. Mm -hmm. And you know they, they have some of their retirement now wrapped up in this. And so your decision-making processes are a lot different. Uh, so you know, when you talk about, you know, Heather, when you, I know in, in sessions coming up, you're gonna be talking about some of these value drivers, the importance of management. It is super, super critical that you have that in place. And really, it's, it's as Scott mentioned too earlier, it's one of the critical components of the value of a company, no matter what. Um, so, you know, it is something that we just can't get around 
having a solid management team that can really take this business and run with it uh, without the owner. It's just, it, it flows throughout every conversation that we have. Yeah. Um, and the last one is sale to a management or family. So basically it's kind of an internal sale. Mike Kerrigan touched on some family dynamics. We have a whole session on this uh, in August on dealing with the family transition. Uh, one thing is it's generally less of an effort because you do, you, you are, you know, the oftentimes, hopefully they're already involved in the business. You don't have all that due diligence. Um, you can come up with payment terms that make sense for you and for the business. There's a lot of benefits that can come along with, with this uh, obvious, one of the big disadvantages, I guess, you know, could be is that you often see the selling price lower because you're giving them a bit of a discount because of that. Or you may, by not going out to the market, one of the things, you know, I've, I've seen over and over and over again is when you go out to the market, you might have a valuation that says your business is worth $10 million, but you get a strategic partner to come in and they might be willing to pay $15 million for this business because of what they think you're, they're going to be able to do with this business. And so sometimes it's uh, without going out to market, you may not know what the real value is because of some of those other dynamics. Now, obviously, some of the other concerns are, are your family members able to, to run this business? What happens if they don't? I think Mike Kerrigan mentioned this morning that if things start going south, we have seen business, the former business owners, the parents, you have to jump back in and save the business because their, their, their retirement depends on it. And so that's a little bit of a scary situation. So you really do have to be, uh, make sure that if it's management or if it's, if it's family member that they're willing to, that they're able to take this on and run with the business the way that it has been run or maybe even better. Now, if we're selling to a partner uh, that's going to remain in the business, much of the same much of the same dynamics exist. Uh, you've already got the trust. They already know the numbers. It's really in those cases, it's a matter of working out a valuation and then working out uh, payment terms, uh, whatever that might be. Now payment terms become, and we'll talk about, become important because it does have a tax impact on how we, how we treat the, the payment terms. So those are the general ones that you see. Again, I'm not talk, getting into uh, you know, equity rollovers and, you know, some, some other things that can get really eccentric, but uh, those are the basics one, but it's, it's really, it's really important to understand. This is what you're looking at. These are the type of uh, uh, possible sales that you're looking at. Now let's talk quickly about payment options and what you'll see from a payment standpoint. So we got cash purchase. And now this cash purchase can be, you know, you got a third party comes in and you go to closing and they're gonna pay you 80% upfront. You're gonna get 80%, but there's a lot of times holdbacks and those holdbacks might be an earnout. And we'll talk about what an earnout is in a minute. Uh, it may be that they've escrowed for uh, liabilities that may be out there that are like contingencies. Uh, it could be working capital. Do you capital. see escrowing at all in, a, um, in an asset sale? Oh yeah. Just, okay, okay. Yep, uh, yeah, I just had one where uh, and in fact, it was kind of interesting when they kind of negotiated it out. First, the, the buyer came in with a 36-month uh, escrow, which is, you know, in my mind was ridiculous. And, you know, talked to the attorney and, you know, got it substantially down from that. Uh, but, they, you know, they, they built in a few escrows for some contingencies that were out there. It, it's unlikely that they'll even need, the escrow will come, will, will most likely come back. Um you know, they'll, they'll, I've also seen some based on working capital uh, holdbacks and some other things like that. Um, it, it's also possible I've seen some deals where they hold back money, like if you're doing a shared bonus with employees. So there's, there's certain things that uh, kind of fall out in there. But, you know, so your cash purchase uh, is, could be that. And then it could be in conjunction with an earnout. And so with an earnout, what happens is they say, okay, we're going to pay you X but we might pay you X plus uh, another million bucks if you hit, if the business grows to this point. Or they might say, hey, we're gonna pay you 80% now, but to get to this 100% is gonna depend on how the business does in the next year. Okay, so those earnouts are, um, you know, earned over a period of time. And this is one where I see a lot of business owners get very, uh, you know, how's the business gonna do without me? You know, are they gonna let me, have input and what happens if 
And if you don't get that earn out, now all of a sudden your purchase price went from say $10 million down to maybe it's $9 million or $8 million, depending on what your earn out is. And, you know, so these can have, and, and earn outs can have some specific tax impacts on you short term as part of the selling price, even though you haven't realized the earn out yet. So that's something we need to plan on when we start looking at these earnouts. Uh, now, on the positive side, when you have a cash purchase, usually we have the option to say, okay, do we want to pay all the tax now or do we do what's called an installment sale and recognize the gain over the period of time that we're receiving the money? Usually with most of these deals, when it's going to a third party, you're going to realize your cash within you know, year one, year two, possibly year three, depending on some of, you know, depending on the term. So you're going to get it pretty quick. And one of the nice things about going to a third party and getting this money quick is your risk does reduce substantially. Now, when we go to a management team or a you know, family member, we might have a term of five, six, seven years. I actually talked to somebody that was looking at a term of, of 10 years. Now, you've got that risk over 10 years on this. Now, the good thing is we can do an installment sale. And we can recognize the gain over that period of time. But... Uh, of course, at the same time, you know, when you do that, you know, like just like we're dealing with right now, we've got a potential tax law change. The tax rates over that 10 years could change, too. So the tax planning, we thought, could be different um, down the road. Yeah. Is there a benefit for a seller that's financing that is doing some type of installment plan in that, like because of the like tax implications? Could they end up paying less? like substantially less by dip, by extending it out over a period of time or no? Uh, not generally, because what you're really doing is spreading the tax out and it yeah. lines up more with, it lines up more with your paying tax now that you've got the money as opposed to paying a tax all at once, but not even getting the money for a number of years. Yeah, yeah. And so that's, that's where the risk, that's where the risk comes on. Um, so I do see there's a question on here. Let me see. read it real quick. Okay, so there, there very well could be a benefit from going to C-Corp to S-Corp, and we've converted many uh, in, in anticipation of sales down the road. Now, here's what happens. You mentioned the five years, so it's a very astute question. So if you sell, if you convert a C-Corp to an S-Corp, within that five-year period, when you sell assets of the business, you may have what's called a built-in gains tax added on top of the gain. So if you sold the assets of the company within that five years, we got to do a calculation to say, okay, what's my built-in gains tax on top of the tax of selling it? Now, it's possible that uh, when you take the sale of the business and the gain as an S-corp that flows to you, plus the built-in gains, it may still be a better benefit than if you paid the corporate rate plus the dividend rate that we talked about earlier. So... Um, there's, there's, it's possible that even in that situation, now let's just say that you don't sell the assets. Let's say you sell the stock. Now the built-in gains uh, is not an issue because you're selling the stock. So there's some planning criteria that we have to go through. And of course, I'm always going to, as accountants, this is our favorite word, two words, it depends. So we got to look at some of your, uh, we got to look at some things that are very specific to your uh, situation to make sure those are some general comments, but we would have to um, um, you know, answer before we go that. Is it common for a buyer to pay royalties to the seller in a non-franchise business? I haven't really seen ro uh, royalties uh, happen too much in a non-franchise business, even in a franchise business. Uh, it depends. Now, we've had royalties in situations where there's some IP in another business. So it depends on your intellectual property, maybe your patents, some of those things. And it may be there are situations where we often separate out when we're looking at an operating company versus a holding company. And it may be that if you've got some intellectual property out there that we want it in a separate business from the, from the operating company because we might sell the operating company. It's also possible that we could bring an investor into the operating company. And so that operating company is then paying a fee for the use of the intellectual property. So there's all sorts of situations that come into play when you have trademarks and patents and other intellectual property that you might be dealing with. All right. So 
this is a lot of words on <laughs> a page. But what I the, the point of this is not for you to get all hung up in it, but when you do an asset sale, and I mentioned this earlier, you then have to say, okay, how am I gonna allocate this purchase price? So for example, let's just say I, I sold my business for $5 million. Now purchase price, out of that, I purchased a accounts receivable for a million bucks, inventory for a million bucks. And so there's 2 million of my purchase price. Now I've got fixed assets and goodwill, okay? So the buyer wants to take that remaining three, $3 million and put as much of it into this class five as possible. That's where your fixed assets are because they're gonna get more of a deduction faster. You want as much of that going into class seven goodwill as possible because that's capital gains for you. Now, when you do it in class five, it's a mix of ordinary and capital gains because there's, some, there's this concept called recapture on depreciation that you took on these assets in the past. So this allocation is something that we wanna talk about and think about early on in the process because that's gonna shape the tax calculations. Now I say down here, if, you know, if, it's, a, if it's a stock sale, you're looking at capital gains, you, you, it's a lot easier of a process. But this purchase price allocation, and it's one of my negotiating points on how you deal with this is uh, from a tax perspective, is how does this allocation go? So it's a, it's a very important piece. And frankly, it never gets talked about until after the deal's even done and you're trying to figure this out and you've lost all the leverage. So let's talk about it before the deal's done and let's get that leverage um, back on your side of things. Uh, so you've, and it may not be perfect, but you know, it's at least something that you can be discussing with them prior to. And once you have that allocation, then we can start looking at the tax planning in a much more accurate way. So it's a very, very important concept in an asset sale. Uh, so a couple of negotiating points that I, I mentioned here uh, along the way. So we, say we've got a C-Corp and we're selling our assets. Um, as I mentioned, and I'll just reiterate it, if I sell the assets of a C-Corp, the C-Corp is gonna realize that gain. C-Corp is gonna pay the tax. They're gonna pay the federal tax. They're gonna pay the, the state income taxes. And then they're going to shoot a dividend out to you and you're going to pay taxes at capital gains rates, whatever those might be. Okay, so again, we're back up into that 45 to 50 ish percent range um, and, you know, and, and possibly going higher. One of the things that can possibly happen is if you are the owner of the business, the sole owner and the name, the business really is because of your personal goodwill you can allocate some of this to your personal goodwill outside the company and you're gonna pay capital gains on that. You're not gonna have all of this other mess. It's something to think about. Now, one of the things that will have to happen is the buyer's gonna to come to you and say, okay, well, what's the value? So you may have to have a valuation done. That valuation is probably worth its weight in gold from the standpoint of saving 20, 25% in taxes. So that's definitely, if you're a C-Corp, it's one of the things that you, you really need to think about. Now, a covenant not to compete is taxed at ordinary tax rates. But again, that covenant, even though it's ordinary, you're not paying the double taxation. So those are some things to think about. In a pass through entity, we just talked about this. How much allocation of that purchase price can you move to Goodwill? Because that Goodwill is where we want to be. Um, and, and Heather asked this question earlier. We have an asset sale versus a stock sale. Well, you know, we may have, we may be able to increase the purchase price in an asset sale and negotiate that by talking to the buyer and saying, listen, you're, you know, we've allocated X amount of dollars to fixed assets. Most of these fixed assets, you're going to be able to deduct right away. You're getting immediate tax savings. And so, you know, we're, we're taking a tax hit on that. So let's increase this, this, this purchase price sum. And effectively you're sharing the, the tax savings. The other thing, and I mentioned this earlier, is looking at installment sales, and you know you might be able to take the the and spread it over two years, spread it over you know three years, depending on what the case might be. So that way you can, you know, we're, we're in the new tax law. I'll go over in a little bit. It's, I say new tax law. It's not a too net, new tax law yet. It's coming. It's it's on its way. Um, you know, it may be that you're trying to stay under a certain threshold. So you keep your tax rates a little bit lower. So we may, depending on the purchase price, we may be able to save a little bit of tax that way by spreading it out some. 
So let's talk about, we've been with Scott alluded to it earlier and I've been alluding to it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things that it's just hovering over everything we talk about in business these days. Uh, so he, here's what's been proposed. Now, again, it's still got to go through Congress. It's still got to go through all that. Uh, you know, will they get all the lawmakers, whether their political affiliation, whatever it is, to go through, you know, uh, uh, at this exact, who knows? I don't know at this point. Um, but this is some of the things we're talking about. So they're looking at increasing the tax rate on C corporations from 21% to 28%. So remember what I just said. So now we got 28%. Let's just say we're in that environment with a C corp. We're at 28%. Plus we've plus we got state income taxes. Let's just say the effective rate on state income tax is 4%. So we're at 32%. Now we now we uh, now have to issue our dividend out, and we issue a dividend out, and now. Our dividends, if you're over a million dollars, might go from 20% to as high as 39%. Plus, we're going to add in that other 3.8%. So we could be looking at effectively 70% taxes on this thing. It gets really, really high, um, you know, by the time all said and done. So this is a this is a really significant uh, increase uh, from a C corp standpoint when you combine it with the capital gains. Now, the second bullet here is increase the highest marginal rate for individuals 39.6. The highest marginal rate right now is 37%. This one, obviously, this goes back to what it was pre-Trump pre, uh, era. Uh, so it's been at that rate for most of my career, that 39.6%. Um, yeah, obviously, it's a tax increase. But that's probably not the most significant component of this. The significant component component when you're dealing with an app with your selling your business is the increase in capital gains rates for taxpayers with AGI over a million dollars. Okay. So what it does is if you, the portion of the gain that's in, in excess of, you know, once you hit a million dollars of income and that takes your income, your wages, your dividends, your capital gains, your, any other business income that's flowing down to you, and once you exceed that million dollars, the capital gains now are looking at potentially being taxed as high as 39.6%. That's a significant increase um, in, in the, the tax rates. So the scary thing is there's been discussion because the president issues is issued his green book, which is you may, you know, you can look up definitions of green book, but basically it's his proposal. And the proposal date basically was April 28th of 2021. There's the possibility, how real it is, I don't know. There's a possibility that these capital gains rates could go up for any transaction that occurs after April 28th of 2021, okay? So it, I'm actually working with a business right now. We are 30 days out from a deal being done and we're sitting here going, okay, if, if they make it retroactive to April 28th, your tax is this, if they make it, if it's not retro, if it's not retroactive and it's in place when they pass the law or effective for 2022, then you're at this level. I, I don't know what to tell you other than it feels like you know a lot of people don't believe it's going to actually get retroactive to April 28th. They think they'll have a hard time getting um, the Senate to pass all, all the members of the Senate to pass a law that goes backwards to April 28th. But I don't know. You know, it's one of those things that I. My crystal ball stopped working a long time ago. Uh, we joke around and say we're, we're really using the magic eight ball rather than the crystal ball at this point because it's just as useful. Um, so that's, you know, that's as much as we know, but from a tax planning standpoint, this is very, very significant. Yeah. Um, and so when you start dealing with, um, and when you start dealing with, uh, you know, what you need to take out of the business at the end of the business, right. this is going to have a huge, huge impact on that. Um, Piece. Now, before I jump into questions, I'm going to stop sharing. I just want to show you real quick um, what a uh, what a flow of if I can find it here. These things start getting hidden on me. Here we go. So I just want to show. This is just a little bit of a sample of what 
flow of a purchase price might look like when we go through. So we got an S-Corp, we got a stock sale in this particular case, gross sales price 10 million with selling expenses of 400,000, capital gains rates right now of, of 20% plus 3.8% net investment income tax down the books of 1.5 million, total basis of four uh, million dollars of basis in that stock, okay? Um, so here we go, it's gross purchase price. We got our selling expenses, less our basis. We got a $5.6 million gain, tax rate of 23.8%. We're looking at tax of 1.3 million. So how does this flow from the standpoint of, what do I get after that? So we got a $10 million purchase price, gross proceeds. We paid our selling expenses. Oftentimes those selling expenses like commissions paid and things like that come out of the proceeds on the day of the sale. We're gonna pay our tax. And, and I, you know, Scott mentioned this and we talked about debt-free cash free. We got to pay the debt off of the business. So 1.5 million goes to pay off the debt after proceeds, our net proceeds are $6.7 million. So, you know, you can see we go, we reduce, we, we take a purchase price of $10 million and we reduce it by over $3 million by the time all said and done. Now, if this was an asset deal, this might go down by another five, six, 7%, maybe more. Uh, so you could be looking at another, you know, hundred thousand to three hundred thousand dollars, depending on things. And of course, this doesn't include reductions for escrows and working capital adjustments and other adjustments in there. But I just want to give you a flavor for what this looks like when, at the end of the day, and how fast uh, a, this great looking purchase price can go down to something that was a lot less than you thought. Okay. Um, so it's 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 one of those really. And so I jump back to. Why do we do the planning process? Why do we try to get this? Because if 6.7 isn't going to do it for you, if you're if you're 50 years old selling your business and you got a lifestyle and, you, and you're going to live for the next 40 years um, and you want to leave something for children or charity or whatever it might be, $6.7 million sounds like a lot, but it may not be enough. And yeah. so that's why this planning process is so critical to say, okay, well, what do we need to do to get this, this sale price from 10 million to 15 million? And those, and that's, and that's really, that's really what we're trying to bring to your attention is you've got to be aware of these facts through this process. So really, they should be talking to you in the process immediately after they get the estimate of value, if yes. not sooner. Yes, and and you know, like Scott mentioned earlier, oftentimes you know that picture of his daughter with you know, the, the person's all excited and they come back and like, what? You know, I, I've seen that too many times where I, I, you know, business owners often think, hey, I've heard that these businesses are getting X multiple. Well, you know, I, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into what drives a multiple. And again, you know, an estimate of value might tell you that your business is worth 10 million, but when, if you go out to market, you know, you might be able to get 12, 13, 14, you, you may not know, but it's a great starting point to understand. And I do think it's, you know, as you go, getting an estimate of value is like a report card in some ways. Are you, are you going the right direction? Are you moving, moving the dial in the, right, in the right way? But it's really critical that we take a look at that and say, okay, what does this mean from an after-tax standpoint? Mm -hmm. And you could give them a pretty good idea of um, what that would look like even before an offer comes in. You, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. We we can get a we can at least get a reasonable uh, estimate. Uh, the the thing that often becomes the trickiest piece is just if you're doing if you're if you're you really got to look at an asset deal and a stock deal. You know, you might be going into it saying, yeah, I want a stock deal, but if all if you if you go out to market and all the buyers come in and say, no, we're only going to do an asset deal, we yeah. got to kind of plan for both both sides of things. I will say most of the deals that I see are asset deals, so yeah. it's. it's it's something we often plan from the asset standpoint. And then of course, the critical factor is how do you allocate out the purchase price? And that's something we've worked with management on to say, okay, what do we think yeah. about that? Makes sense. Yeah. Cool, okay. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. Well, that was, uh, that was informative for me. And um, I've got a, a couple of things I can be uh, taking to my clients um, just from that conversation too. And so we need to do more of these just so we can learn from each other. This was good. <laughs> Um, so thank you all for attending. As a reminder, we've got one more uh, session coming up on August 11th. That's going to include three webinars. The first one's going to be Introduction to Value Building, uh, where we'll go into each of those value drivers and talk about what we can do to enhance value within each. We'll talk about choosing and preparing a, a successor. 
um, and that could be, you know, preparing a, um, a, an adult child or an employee or, um, some, or another person coming into the role. And then we'll also uh, have a webinar specific to family business transitions, which, um, as you might suspect, has some, some interesting um, idiosyncrasies that are, are worth considering. So um, look for an email reminder around that. We'll be sending out an email in the next couple of days that has a link to um, these sessions. Um, and we'll have one, one per session so you can watch again later at your leisure. Um, and if you have any other questions for us, feel free to reach out. We're here, we're available, and uh, love helping with all this stuff. So. Uh, am I missing anything, Mike? Can you think of anything else I need to add? I think you got it. I, I think the next sessions are going to be just critically important to continuing this planning process. So looking yeah. forward to everybody attending. Yeah, and please, um, if you have specific questions or thoughts that you want to make sure that we cover, um, I would love to hear that. Uh, send it to me, uh, email or LinkedIn or whatever. I'd be happy to hear that and make sure that we work those in. So, um, all right. Well, thank you all. We will see you on August 11th.